Yeah, thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, as Scott mentioned, I've uh, had the privilege of studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and that's uh, a journey that started when I was uh, part of a company called Tripwire here in town in uh, Portland. And, and so the goal was always to understand uh, how did these amazing organizations simultaneously achieve the best project due date performance and development, the best operational stability and reliability in ops, as well as the best posture of security and compliance. And so our goal was always to understand how did those amazing organizations make their good to great transformation. Why would we do that? Because we want to understand how other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so, uh, as you can imagine, in that 18-year journey, there were many surprises. But by far, the biggest surprise was how it took me into the middle of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. Uh, I mean, I think at the last time that we've seen any industry being disrupted to the extent that our industry is being disrupted today was probably manufacturing in the 1980s, when it was, it was revolutionized uh, through the application of the lean principles. And so that's, I think, what is exactly happening to us now. Uh, I think DevOps really is what you get when you take those same principles and apply it to the technology value stream. So that applies to dev, ops, security, test, uh, and certainly the organizations that we serve. So uh, what I want to do in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so is share with you the top surprises uh, and top learnings I've had in um, co-authoring the Phoenix, uh, the, 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 the DevOps handbook which has been five and a half years in the making. And so uh, some of you may laugh that the DevOps handbook is finally out because we, you know, you're probably laughing because that we promised it for about five and a half years. In fact, uh, many people don't know is that this book was supposed to come out before the Phoenix Project. And so I can't overstate how much I've learned since uh, the Phoenix Project came out. And so what I want to share with you, probably the top six or seven surprises uh, that will hopefully be interesting uh, to you. Um, so the surprise number one that I certainly wish we had uh, known before the Phoenix project came out is to what extent uh, the business value that is created when you apply DevOps principles and patterns. And, and so I want to share with you research that uh, I've done with Jez Humble. So he's a co-author on the DevOps handbook, but he's probably better known for the um, work that he did as a co-author of the book, Continuous Delivery. Um, and this was a research that we also did with Dr. Nicole Forsgren. Uh, and so with Puppet Labs, over the last now five years, uh, we did a cross-population study that's now spanned over 26,000 respondents. What we found for now four years running is that the high-performing organizations that are applying DevOps principles and patterns are massively outperforming their non-high-performing peers. Uh, and so, um, as measured by what? So uh, the first uh, dimension of uh, what we measured was throughput. So what we found is that high performers are doing 200 times more frequent deployments, uh, and that could be deployments of code, or it could also be deployments of changes in the environment. So both considered to be changes that are deployed to production. But more importantly, they can complete those changes 2,500 times more quickly uh, than the non-high performers. So in other words, how quickly can we go from some sort of change being committed to version control um, through test, through deployments, so it's actually running in production successfully where customers are actually getting value. And so high performers can do it in minutes or hours whereas lower performers might require weeks, months, or quarters, right? And so that is uh, a three order of magnitude difference, 2,555 times, times faster. So um, again, so that's one dimension of performance. The other dimension of performance is reliability. So not only are high performers getting more work done, but you know, for now four years running, we're finding that high performers are getting far better outcomes. When they do a deployment, they're three times more likely to succeed without causing a service outage, a service impairment, a security breach or a compliance failure. Uh, and when things go wrong, which Murphy's Law guarantees that does happen, uh, they can fix those issues 25, four times more quickly. In other words, the mean time to store service uh, is 24 times faster. So you know, when we first found this in 2013, 2014, you know, this is a very important finding because it said it validated our common experience that in general, the larger the size of the deployments we make, you know, the more things go wrong, right? The longer it takes to diagnose, and essentially the more time it requires for us to restore service, right? The bigger the change, the larger the crater in the data center that we make, right? The longer it takes to restore service. And so, you know, the count, uh, the, um, uh, the converse of that, right, is that if we want reliability profiles like this, we need to do smaller deployments more frequently, right? Which is something well known in the DevOps community. Uh, this last year, we found this other dimension of quality, which is that because high performers are integrating information security objectives into everybody's daily work, uh, they are consequently spending one half the amount of time remediating security issues, right? So by building security in, right, the reward is that we spend a lot less time uh, remediating security issues when things you know, go wrong. And because high performers are uh, doing a better job in controlling unplanned work, 
they're able to deploy nearly a third more planned uh, work, you know, in terms of more strategic value adding activities versus the far less uh, valuable firefighting, you know, that happens, you know, when, you know, things are out of control. So uh, it's not just about IT performance. Uh, what we discovered two years ago uh, was that, uh, you know, high performers also have better organizational performance. Uh, they are twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And uh, for those nearly 1,000 organizations that gave us a stock ticker symbol, we found that those organizations had 50% higher market cap growth over three years. Um, and so I'll be the first to admit that this is a preposterous finding, right? This is very difficult to believe because essentially what this asks you to believe is that how a server administrator or how a network admin or how a developer, how they perform their daily work could directly impact profitability and even be visible in share price, right? And, you know, that is what we found. Uh, but so why, you know, why on earth should we believe that? And I find this to be very believable because that, you know, if we believe that how any organization these days, it's not just companies like New Relic, right? It's any organization in every industry vertical, how we acquire our customers and how we deliver value to those customers is reliant upon the work that we do every day, right? So maybe being three orders of magnitude faster than our competition will create decisive winners and losers in the marketplace. And so that I find, you know, I have no problems believing. I find that to be very compelling. So there's other, another marker of organizational performance we found last year, uh, which is that in high performers, employees are 2.2 times more likely to recommend to their friends their organizations as a great place to work, right? And so that's as measured by the employee net promoter score. And so this is, could be considered a proxy for employee retention, the ability to hire and retain great talent. Uh, this is also, you can consider a proxy for, you know, the culture surveys that go out from, you know, HR departments, right? That many executives bonuses are tied to. Right, and so this is, you know, was great to find because it gives us another thing to latch onto as we try to sell, you know, the value of DevOps internally. So that's uh, certainly um, yeah, an important dimension of performance. There's one last thing that uh, I thought to be one of the most you know, amazing kind of findings out of this research was this notion of deploys per day being potentially a proxy for something even more important. So one of the big mysteries in the DevOps community is this notion of this ever increasing number of deployments per day, right? Flickr in 2009 did this shockingly fast 10 deploys a day. Amazon in 2011 shocked the world when they disclosed that they were doing 15,000 deployments per day. By 2015, Ken Exner, uh, the director of dev productivity at Amazon said, we're no longer doing 15,000 deployments per day. We're doing 136,000 deployments per day, right? And so, you know, the big question is, is like, why does, you know, in high performers, does the number of, develop, uh, the, does the number of deployments per day keep increasing? And we start to suspect that the number of that deploys per day is a proxy for maybe an even more important metric, which is deploys per day per developer. So in 2015, what we tested was this. Um, in fact, let me just show you the finding. So on the y-axis is the number of deploys per day. On the x-axis is the number of developers. And what we found is in the low performers, as you increase the number of developers, deployments per day goes down. In medium performers, as you increase the number of developers, deployments per day remain constant. Whereas in the highest performers, as you increase the number of developers, deploys per day goes up linearly, right, as you increase the number of developers. So the reason why I think this is so important is that uh, Frederick Brooks wrote this famous book called The Mythical Man Month in the 1970s, right? And what it taught generations of managers is that in general, um, you know, our common experience is that you know, if you double the number of developers, you double the code integration effort, you double the test effort, and you ultimately double the effort actually required to get value to customers, right? And, you know, that's something that most of us have lived with. But what this shows us is that under certain conditions with the right architecture, the right cultural norms, and the right technical practices, we can actually scale developer productivity linearly, you know, as we increase the number of developers. And we were just talking beforehand, right? It's like if, you, if that is considered as important as features, you know, we can actually scale uh, productivity as we increase uh, the number of engineers. And engineers I'll broadly define as dev, test, ops, and infosec. How am I doing here so far? Is this interesting? Is that cool? <laughs> right, so theory building and theory testing. So surprise number one is just on how many dimensions we can show the value of adopting DevOps principles and patterns. Surprise number two um, is that DevOps is as good as for as for is as good for operations as it is for development. So you know one of the things that I did not no, and I wasn't didn't fully internalize was this famous case study, um, you know, from Facebook chat, and uh, you know this happened in 2008, and so this might be one of the many reasons why you might roll your eyes, saying, you know, why would this be such an interesting case study? In fact, 
you know, in many undergraduate CS programs, uh, you write chat servers, right? So it doesn't sound like very like a very hard problem. Uh, it turns out the Facebook chat functionality was actually one of the most difficult technical undertakings ever taken uh, at Facebook. It was the largest project team. It took one year for them to do. It was complex for so many reasons. Um, it was the first use of Erlang on the back end. It was, uh, you know, it's an order, it's order n cubed. A chat is at its, you know, heart is an order n cubed algorithm, and n in Facebook's case is 75 million simultaneous users, right? So, uh, you know, it took them one year for them to develop and deliver it to customers. So how did they use that year? There's essentially two practices that really stood out to me. One was the notion of the daily deployment, right? You know, even at the earliest stages of uh, the chat team, whatever they checked into the source code repos would be silently migrated to the production environment, invisible to customers without causing chaos and disruption, right? And they would do it not at midnight on Friday, working all weekend to get things running. You know, they would do it you know, at 2 p.m. Pacific time when everyone's already in the office. The second thing that you know, I found astonishing was the notion that they were using almost every Facebook browser user session as a testing harness, right? So consider like the Facebook JavaScript code that every user is running right in their browser. Uh, you know, they actually modified that code. So it's actually sending invisible test chat messages to the still invisible and latent chat services on the back end, right? And why would they do that? It was so that it could simulate production like loads even at the earliest stages uh, of the chat project, right? And so you know, just so you know where I came from, even though I was formally trained as a developer, I self-identify as, as an ops person, right? And if you had told me five years ago and you know, said, is it ever okay for a developer to test in production? I would have said, absolutely not, right? That's crap. That's what developers do because they hate us ops people, right? They're lazy, they don't care about quality, right? They don't know how to plan, right? And that's why you test in production. And it turns out you know, not to be the case, right? You can, the reason why you can test in production is that you can find you know, performance issues and all these non-functional errors long, you know, even in the earliest stages of the project when we have the most amount of you know, ability you know, to make cha the necessary changes. Unless you think that's only possible in open source hippie companies like Facebook, Right, you should know about another case study. This is from CSG. They're the largest bill printing company in the United States. So if you uh, ever get a paper bill from you know, Comcast or Charter Communications or DirecTV, chances are it comes from uh, one of the two CSG bill printing plants in the US. So they're about a billion dollar company. They're publicly traded. And, and so this, what actually prints those bills are in my mind, the architectural worst case of what you can do DevOps on. It, requires, it runs on 20 different technology stacks, right? You name the technology, J2E, .NET, Thick Client, Thin Client, COBOL, uh, vSAM, right? All on the mainframe, right? It all, you know, DB2, it, you know, it's in there. Oh, 136,000 customer support representative, you know, desktops, right? This is all part of the technology stack, which must be deployed upon in order to do a release, right? So as part of their DevOps transformation, they went from doing two releases a year to four releases a year. Right, and uh, part of that was predicated on the notion of doing a daily deployment. So every day, a team spanning dev and ops would do a deployment of 20 technology stacks, you know, to enable a new version of the UAT environment. And so, what were the outcomes? Two weeks uh, within a year of when they started this practice, the incident count whenever they did a release went down by 90 percent. The mean time to repair went down by 98 percent, and more importantly. You know, the code deployment lead time, the time required to actually go from the changes are ready to go into production to actually running went from 14 days down to a day. So think about that. That's essentially 14 people of release engineers deploying into production, you know, trapped in a war room with executives coming in saying, are we done yet? To which they would probably have to respond, no, we're not done yet. You know, we have 13 more days to go, right? It went from that to the, the release being completed by essentially 1 p.m. on the first day, right? The Xboxes come out because there are no live site incidents and uh, essentially they're waiting for, you know, acceptance from the customer. So great for dev testing operations. Um, and incidentally, the customers often get the value in half the time because we're doubling the number of, we doubled the release frequency. And just to punctuate why I think this is so amazing, this quote comes from Nathan Schimmick. He said, as a lifelong ops practitioner myself, I know that we need DevOps to make our work humane. He said, in the course of my career, I've worked on every holiday, on my birthday, even worse, on my spouse's birthday, and even on the day my son was born. And so some of you may have friends who have been in that situation where you know, they've had to be, do this right out of a sense of duty or obligation, or they didn't have a choice. Or some of you might be like me, where you've been complicit in creating these inhumane work systems 
that have forced people to do deployments, right? In uh, starting on Friday at midnight, working all weekend, right? And uh, you know, I think the reason why DevOps has so much significance for so many of us is that we now know that there's a better way, right? And so why don't we do that? There's another, um, so great, DevOps is obviously great for operations, but you know, it's even better or just as good for development. This is one of my favorite quotes that I heard from Patrick Lightbody. This is before he was at uh, New Relic. Uh, this is uh, back at the Velocity Conference in 2011. Back then he was uh, at a company called uh, New Star that was acquired by New Star. And he said, you know, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever, right? And, you know, which I thought was fantastic. And even Werner Vogels would say it even more succinctly. If you helped build it, you must help run it, right? And, and so, uh, you know, I'm aware that jackasses like me showing off jackass slides like this, right, could be mobilizing an entire generation of developers to hate DevOps, right? Because what they would say is that we did not become a developer to wear a pager, right? The reason why ops people became ops people is because they like pagers, right, they would say, right? And so I recognize that there is an internal consistency to that logic, and yet, you know, I think there's actually a better narrative. And that narrative comes from another uh, person from Portland. He said, uh, and this is Tim Tischler. For many years, he was leading the DevOps initiative at Nike. And he said, as a career-long developer myself, by the way, any extra part of people here? <laughs> so Ron Forrester was now a senior director at Nike, right? Are you at Nike these days? No. Oh, okay. So um, Tim Tischler is working, you know, uh, Ron Forrester's group. And uh, he said, as a career-long developer myself, um, the best time was when I got to write the code, test it myself, push it into production myself, uh, and see happy customers when it worked, and when I got to see their angry shaking fists when it didn't work, and when I could fix it myself, <laughs> right? He said, um, I wouldn't have to open up a ticket, and I wouldn't have to wait a day for someone else to do it, right? Not only could I have done it faster, right? I could have learned something that would have prevented me from making the same error the next time around. And so having come from information security and compliance and from the ITIL community, you know, I think you know, I've been a part of a movement that's actually prevented developers over the last decade from being able to self-test, self-deploy, and God forbid, self-fix, right? Uh, you know, and because that was just never done. Um, I think that's actually taken a lot of joy out of development work. And you know, the irony is that you know, patterns like developers being put on page rotation, just like ops people, actually allows us to actually bring joy back you know, to development work. Um, how am I doing here so far? Is this too cavalier claim? Can you give me a thumbs up? Uh, <laughs> All right, so it's great for ops, and you know, in a very paradoxical way, it's actually great for development in a very unexpected way. So you know, the big surprise here is that um, you know, uh, you know, what's common to dev and ops is that we're both engineers. Increasingly, we're going to be using the same development practices. This, mostly, uh, we're going to be sharing the same tools. You know, we're going to be you know, sharing the same pool of work, right? Uh, whether we call it an incident or a problem or a work item, whether it's in JIRA or ServiceNow or whatever, right? It, it's all work. In fact, you know, one of the big surprises is that you know, in the benchmarking that we've done uh, with uh, you know, the span 24,000 respondents, the top predictor of both IT performance and organizational performance for four years is basically the same, is this one behavior is, whoops, is ops using version control. <laughs> so, in fact, whether ops uses version control is a, has a higher predictor of performance than whether dev uses version control, right? And I think the reason is that, you know, where is there more entropy? Where, where are the more configurable settings, right? Is it in the code or is it in the environment, right? And I think most people would say it's in the environment. And in fact, if that's where the entropy is, well, then that's actually what belongs most, right, in version control. So, so surprise number one is, you know, the business value created by DevOps. Uh, two is uh, how good DevOps is good for just not only dev, but also ops. The third big surprise uh, is the importance of code deployment lead time. So the reason why this is so surprising to me is that it looks like a very tactical metric, and yet I now believe, you know, with, you know, uh, I guess evidence backed up by 24,000 uh, respondents, is that in my mind, this is probably one of the most strategic measurements of any technology organization. And so even though uh, in the DevOps community, our favorite metric is probably deploys per day, right? I mean, everyone loves bragging about that, and it's so fun to talk about. In the manufacturing community, that's obviously not their most favorite metric. Their most favorite metric is probably lead time. And so uh, they would measure it. Uh, well, in fact, 
there's this deeply held belief in the manufacturing community, especially in the lean community, that goes back 60, 70 years, that says lead time is the most accurate predictor of internal quality, external customer satisfaction, and even employee happiness. Right? What we found in our benchmarking work is that that's absolutely true for the work that we do as well. And so uh, in manufacturing, they would probably measure it by how quickly can we go from a customer order or maybe raw materials at one end of the plant to finished goods at the other. Right? Um, and in the, in the work that we did, we specifically measured lead time by how quickly can we go from code committed or any sort of change committed to version control through the test process, through deployment, to so it's actually running in production. Right? And that begs the very logical question of why do we start the lead time clock at changes being introduced into version control? Why don't we start it earlier when a feature is actually accepted you know, into work by development or when an idea is first conceived? And it's because we believe that the point at which changes are introduced into version control is the dividing line between two very different parts of the value stream. To the left of uh, being committed to version control is design and development. And so if you were to create a histogram of lead time of any work item in development or design, uh, you know, it would be very short and wide, right? In other words, you know, there's not a lot of um, predictability to lead time. And it also tends to be longer, right? It's not measured in minutes or hours. It's typically days, weeks, or maybe even months. And so I think that's just the nature of design and development work, right? We never get a chance to practice design and development. You know, we often do work for the first time, never again to be repeated, right? So it's just highly variable. Um, however, everything to the right of changes being put into version control, we want the exact opposite. In testing and operations, we want every test and every deployment to be exactly the same time. Every, we want it to be the same every time, right? We want it to happen very quickly, right? Um, and so by no means am I suggesting that testing happens only after design and development are complete, right? We want it, you know, if we have things like test driven development, we're actually writing the tests before a line of code is ever written, right? So what's magical about code deployment lead time is that it simultaneously predicts the effectiveness of testing and operations, but it also predicts how quickly can we give developers feedback on their work. So if I'm a developer and I make an error and I check it into version control, and if I only discover that six to nine months later during integration testing, right, if it takes that long to find the error, then the link between cause and effect has almost certainly been lost, right? And our ability to learn from those mistakes has almost vanished, right? In the ideal, you know, the, what we want is that automated testing will find those errors within minutes, worst case hours, right? And by doing that, you know, we not only create great testing and operations um, performance, but we also give developers the fastest possible feedback on their work, right? And also code deployment lead time also predicts how fast we can actually feed in customer feedback, right? Let alone testing feedback. Am I making sense? Okay. So, you know, again, code deployment lead time, again, it looks like a very tactical measurement, but I honestly believe that it is one of the most strategic measures of any technology organization. So, you know, all that having been said, it turns out there's actually this one question you can ask that predicts not only IT performance, but organizational performance, and as well as predicting the presence of all these kind of magical attributes that create great performance, like version control, automated testing, high trust culture, um, proactive monitoring of the uh, production environment. So what is that one question? Um, the question you ask is very simple. You ask on a scale of one to seven, to what degree do we fear doing deployments, right? <laughs> one is we have no fear at all. We do it all the time as part of our daily work. Seven is we have such existential fear of doing deployments, we do them never, <laughs> right? right? Now is not a good year. So it turns out that, you know, um, is a great predictor of IT performance, organizational performance, as well as all these, you know, things that we know, um, you know, is required to get great performance. And by the way, uh, it also probably predicts, you know, our, in the, the our architecture. You know, how many people do we need to, get, you know, take out to lunch in order to actually ship a feature, or how many people do we need to get approvals for? Or like, you know, to what degree does leadership support us? You know, all of that, you know, can be answered by that question. Um, yeah, you know, how much do we fear doing deployments? So that's surprise number three. So surprise number four, um, surprise number one, business value DevOps. Two is um, DevOps is great for ops and dev. Three is this importance of code deployment lead time. The fourth is how much Conway's law uh, affects that. And so 
I will admit that I've gone to many DevOps conferences, and it's very difficult to go to a conference without someone mentioning Conway's Law. And while I sort of understood what it was, I had a very difficult time articulating how it could actually you know, impact how we would design our work systems, let alone how we execute our work. So for those of you, uh, of course, you know, what, what is Conway's Law? So Dr. Melvin Conway in 1968 did the very famous experiment uh, where he uh, essentially got a research grant to build a COBOL compiler and an ALGOL compiler. He put five people to the COBOL job, three to the ALGOL job. And the results were that the COBOL compiler ran in five phases, five people, five phases. The ALGOL compiler ran in three, right? Three people, three phases, right? And so uh, it has been paraphrased by Eric S. Raymond. Uh, he is the author of uh, the famous book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. He also um, created this kind of great, it's called the Devil's Dictionary. And you know, I think he created the more accessible version of Conway's Law, which says, if you have four groups working on a compiler, you will get a four-pass compiler. So how does this relate to DevOps? And I'll be honest, I didn't know uh, until I ran into a case study about the birth and death of Etsy Sprouter. So I love this case study because it shows how Conway's Law can hurt us and how it can help us. So here's what happened. So as part of the, um, so let's start with like the problem. So in 2008, there was this problem that at Etsy, um, incidentally, this is where it's pre slightly predated John Allspaugh joining as their uh, VP of operations. Uh, John Allspaugh being the part of the famous Allspaugh Hammond uh, Flickr presentation saying how they're doing 10 deploys a day every day uh, in 2009. So uh, back in you know bad old Etsy days, uh, they had this problem that in order to deliver any sort of business functionality, it required two teams to do work. You had to have the devs working on the front end in PHP, and then you had to have the DBAs implement their portion of the changes as stored procedures inside of Postgres, right? So that meant you had two teams that had to coordinate, marshal, sequence, prioritize, et cetera, in order to get anything done. So to in an attempt to solve this problem, they created something called the Sprouter. It's short for stored procedure router. So it was basically a piece of middleware that ran in between the um, development group and the DBA group. And the idea was that both of them could then work independently and they could meet in the middle uh, inside of Sprouter. The problem is now we went from, you know, in order to implement functionality, we went from two teams having to do work to three teams having to do work. And as described by, the, uh, by them, they said, this required a degree of communication and coordination that was rarely achieved. Every deployment became a mini outage, right? And so um, as part of the great Etsy transformation uh, of which John Oswald was a part of, um, you know, there became a focused effort to kill Sprouter. And so the goal was to use you know, this object relational model inside of PHP so that you know, all changes could be actually implemented just by the developers, right? Without having to need any other changes by any other teams. And so the result was that the amount of communication and coordination and prioritization and sequencing and deconflicting you know, went away. So not only did reliability go through, you know, go through the roof, but also the abilities for small teams to independently develop, test, and deploy value to customers you know, was fully realized, right? Because now you know, we've reduced the number of dependencies, right? And so I love the story because it, show, you know, it shows how Conway's law can hurt by increasing the number of teams that we need to communicate and coordinate with, right? And also how it can help by enabling small teams to independently develop, test, and deploy value to customers. Am I making, is that cool? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I just, I, I love this. I think in 10 years, this will be part of every MBA program, right? And uh, because, you know, this work applies to not just technology work, but any work that we do. So the lesson for me is that the organization and the architecture have to be congruent, right? You know, whenever there's like a big reorg, right? There has to be, in order to get the outcomes that we want, there typically will have to be some sort of architectural change to the software that we you know, have to live in, right? In order to get the outcomes uh, that we want. So to make this very concrete, right? Uh, whenever, here's what kind of the worst case architecture looks like is that when organizations can't deploy, have code deployment lead times that aren't measured in minutes or months, it's usually measured in weeks, months, or quarters. And it's because, you know, if we were to create a value stream map as we initiate the deployment on the beginning, right, and then, you know, actually have happy customers on the right, there are hundreds of steps, 
right? And often things don't go right. You know, our work sits in queue. You know, things are don't come back the right way. Our test environments aren't configured correctly, right? Our test data state's not there. The manual regression testing isn't happening fast enough. You know, all those things. Oh, and architecturally, it doesn't help that we have all our database people in one group, all the J2EE apps in another group, .NET in another, right? JavaScript in another group. It means that to get anything done, we have to sort of thread our work through all those work centers, right? So instead, we need single piece flow. Um, awesome. So this has some profound implications on like how we design our organizations. And, and so when we have kind of, you know, uh, this is a was done by a whole bunch of people in the DevOps Enterprise community. You know, they said, you know, when we have functional silos where all the developers live in one group, tests lives in another group, ops live in another group, and they're subdivided by silos, right? That's actually what leads to high number of handoffs, right? And high amounts of rework. You know, ideally what we want is kind of, you know, uh, platforms to enable teams to be able to get what they need completely self-service. They can right click someplace, run something in a command line script, and they can get what they need, you know, without having to open up a ticket or wait two weeks, right? So, um, flash some things out here. And if you're interested in this, I'll show you where you can get all these resource guides. So surprise number, uh, this leads to surprise number five. Um, surprise number one was business value of DevOps. Two is DevOps is great for dev and ops. Three is the importance of code deployment lead time. And surprise number four is how Conway's law, you know, has a significant uh, impact on our ability to have fast flow and short uh, lead times. Surprise number five um, is, one of the more profound ones. I think when historians look back um, at what we're doing right now, um, I think they will consider to be DevOps to be a subset of something much larger. And specifically, they would say that DevOps is probably a subset of what they would call dynamic learning organizations. Uh, and I think one of the best people have described dynamic learning organizations is a gentleman named Dr. Steven Spear. Um, so he's credited for writing probably what is the most famous Harvard Business Review article of all time. And it's, uh, it's called decoding the DNA of the Toyota production system. And so that was based on work that he did as, as his um, PhD dissertation at the Harvard Business School. And so as he was working on his PhD, uh, to inform his work, uh, he actually worked on the assembly line uh, at a tier one supplier to Toyota for six months. Right? And before they, the Toyota executives allowed him to do that, he was first required to work uh, in a big three automotive plant for 30 days. Right? Essentially what they were saying is, until you work in a you know, regular auto plant, you will not be able to appreciate the lessons that you're going to learn you know, uh, spending six months uh, in a Toyota plant or a tier one Toyota plant. So uh, he then went on to expand the lessons that he learned, not just to manufacturing, but to um, safety culture uh, at Alcoa, to engine design at Pratt & Whitney, to uh, the design and operations at the US Naval Reactor Corps, um, and to now healthcare organizations. And what he said was, while designing perfectly safe systems are beyond, is likely beyond our abilities, safe systems are close to achievable when four following conditions are met. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through what the four conditions are. Um, and then I will overlay onto them, you know, essentially some of the DevOps patterns, um, you know, onto them just so you can see how they fit. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is to share with you the third of the four capabilities. Uh, I, I took a, uh, Dr. Spears workshop at MIT uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, it was such an amazing week. But when I learned about the third capability, I realized, holy cow, we missed like so much of, you know, we had a blind spot, right? There was a whole set of DevOps principles and patterns that we, we just didn't properly uh, address. And so I would blame Dr. Spear for at least two years of the delay of the DevOps handbook. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you why that is, and maybe um, I don't mean to blame him, but uh, you know, maybe you'll see like why it's such a you know significant aha moment. So the first of the four capabilities is that he says complex work must be managed um, so that problems in designs are quickly revealed, right? And we do that through creating telemetry, you know, everywhere, right? Uh, so that we are always relentlessly testing our assumptions. So in our world, you know, I, I think the analogs are like assert statements, right? You know, any place where we can find like there's an assertion that's not actually true, you know, we actually do want to find that, you know, as quickly as possible. Whenever we have a continuous build or continuous test process um, uh, or continuous integration, uh, continuous deployment, 
right? The whole idea is that when someone breaks the build, um, you know, we really want to take decisive actions, right? Um, in the um, in the Toyota world, there's a notion of the and on cord, which I'll talk to later, right? The notion is that you know we don't let someone break the build and then or break unit tests. You know, we want them to stop that person from doing that because if we don't stop that person, they'll break more unit tests or whatever, right? Um, you know, we also, this is enabled by proactive monitoring of the production environment, right? So anyway, the point of capability one is that we want to radiate as much information uh, in every part of our code and our environment and our deployment pipeline and so forth, right? But obviously it's not enough just to see problems, right? We also need to be able to swarm them uh, so we can, you know, quickly fix the issues uh, and more importantly, build new knowledge, right? And, and so, again, the most famous example of uh, this is the Toyota and on cord, um, where if something goes wrong on the assembly line, you know, if the parts aren't there, if the parts are defective, if even the work takes longer than documented, right? You pull the cord. And of course, what happens when you pull the cord? You, the entire assembly line stops, right? And so, um, you know, this is obviously, you know, the reason why, you know, uh, at so many organizations, like I actually got to observe here at New Relic, is that if someone breaks the build, well, I think they still do this, right? You know, lights go off in the, you know, on the build lights. Um, you know, people immediately know that we're now in a no longer green state, right? And, you know, we got to do whatever it takes to get things running um, so that the tests are passing, so we get back into a deployable state. So the reason we want to do this is that we want to create as much feedback in our system, right, from as many areas of the system sooner, faster, and cheaper. And w when we do that, we can enable us to find, you know, the most link the strongest links between cause and effect. And essentially, capability two is exactly what enables um, us to invalidate as many other things. And when we do that, this is what actually enables learning. So I mentioned uh, you know, the famous Toyota and on cord. I spent a week at the University of Michigan getting trained in the Toyota production process. And it really is true, right? You pull the cord, right? And you know, uh, you know, if you don't fix the issue in 55 seconds, the entire assembly line stops. Um, so you know, that was uh, maybe not, that was a big surprise, but the big surprise was how many times in a typical day, you know, the and on cord is pulled in a typical plant, right? So just think of a number. How many times do you think the and on cord is pulled in a typical day? All right, 3,500 times a day, right? And so, like you, you know, my reaction is like, these guys are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing, right? Why would they do that? And I think... The reason why I react that way is that the way I was trained is that the role of managers, right, is to buffer errors, right? If something goes wrong locally, you know, you want to buffer that error so it doesn't cause some sort of effect at the global level, right? And it seems like the Andon cord is doing something very different, right? It is magnifying a local disturbance and turning it into a global disturbance, right? And so, you know, why would we do that? It's because we want to prevent daily workarounds. We want to make systemic fixes then and there, right? Uh, at the end the if you're in a Toyota plant and every operation must take 55 seconds or less, right? If you don't put in a systemic fix then and there, if you, you know, essentially you're going to have the same problem 55 seconds later, right? So that's the notion of the daily workaround. And so daily workarounds happen in our work, but it's not as visible because our work takes longer than 55 seconds to perform, right? But it's just as destructive. So what are the behaviors that I would consider capability to? It's we stop work when builds, tests, deployments, and services break, right? Um, and if a, an engineer needs help getting unit tests in a passing state or acceptance tests or whatever, right, they can get whatever help they need because nothing is more important than getting back into a green state. Here's another one that I find even more subtle but even more profound. If I need a peer review to get into production, then, I, you know, everybody, should, you know, if, whoever I ask should drop whatever they're doing to give me that plus one or plus two so I can go into production. In other words, you know, why? Because tomorrow that person might need a peer review to go into production, right? And I need to be able to help them, right? So it's that golden rule. Um, so again, this is what we need to do to find errors earlier and fix things earlier, right? When, you know, uh, before we allow technical debt to accrue. So, you know, I think the paragon and the reward of doing these things, um, you know, makes us look like Google, right? Um, in 2013, Google had 15,000 engineers, and that number is probably almost twice as large now. But even back then, uh, 15,000 engineers, broadly defined as dev, test, ops, infosec, dev productivity, you know, shared services, et cetera. And they're working on 4,000 simultaneous projects. And trust me, there's no project management office you know, surveilling every product group, 
right? Asking them to fill in a spreadsheet that has 4,000 rows in it, right? They're working with a tremendous amount of autonomy, right? And they're able to work independently without a lot of external dependencies. And safety, right? Small errors don't cause global catastrophic outages. A lot of that is enabled by, you know, what the conformity that's created by having a shared source code repo, you know, across almost every Google property. So if you're a new engineer at Google, you, have, you work within a source code repo that has almost every Google property in it. And interestingly, um, here's a sort of happy accident. Back in 2005, the Google search uh, you know, application was essentially a statically linked C++ binary, right? And because it's statically linked, it meant they can only have one version of each library allowed, right? So contrast that to a friend of mine. He said, I'm at a large bank, and of the 93 versions of the Java Struts library, we are running 92 of them in production, right? So imagine all the organizational drag that's created when you have to support 92 versions of Java Struts. Um, oh, and incidentally, all but one of them are actually insecure, right? So uh, that consistency and conformity is what allows them to do 5,500 code commits per day. Uh, almost every Google property uh, deploys at least once per day. Uh, and that's enabled by this notion of doing 7,500 million test cases that are being run daily, right? And some of you might roll your eyes saying that's what you do when you have 10 million servers or however many they have, right? But I think that actually misses the point. The point is, you know, why would they write hundreds of thousands of test cases and run them thousands of times per day, right? It generates heat, and it's not free, right? It costs electricity, it generates heat, right? It causes all these problems. And, you know, Aaron Masseri, part of the dev productivity group at uh, Google said, it is only through automated testing that we can transform fear into boredom, right? He said, imagine the paralyzing fear that any new engineer has at Google, knowing that anytime you commit code, Right, you can take down every Google property at the same time, right? Which has happened. You know, the only way that you can actually get people to hit enter, right, is by showing them that there's this amazing safety net underneath them that will detect errors quickly, right, and allow and we'll be able to fix them quickly. And just a little side note here: whenever we're in a work system where we need 35 approvals from different people, right, to get our changes into the <laughs> into trunk, little into production, it's usually a symptom that we are working in a very tightly coupled system where small changes, you know, can have, you know, catastrophic impact, right? And so, you know, the goal is we need safer systems that are more loosely coupled, so small changes create smaller errors. Um, by the way, I love your shirt, <laughs> your DevOps Enterprise shirt. Um, awesome. So, okay, so that's capability two. Um, capability three was a big eye-opener for me. Uh, any chance you were at DevOps Enterprise 2015 when Dr. Steven Spears spoke? Oh, okay. Um, so capability three was the big eye opener. Um, he said there must be some mechanism where local discoveries are turned into global knowledge. In other words, right, we must be able to take new learnings and use it to elevate the state of the entire practice. And so for me, right, I mean, this was the big eye opener. Um, so here are all the practices I think fall into category three. Capability three. One is this notion of the source shared source code repo, right? In you know, Microsoft, they did a study. Um, they said across the Microsoft enterprise, you know, uh, you know, involves sixty thousand plus technologists and engineers. How many XML parsers do we have? Right. The answer was three hundred and fifty, <laughs> right? Which is kind of strange, right? Because there's only one version of XML, right? So why would they have three hundred versions? There should be one, right? Uh, because that means every time someone finds an error we can fix it and then every product group you know, inherits those learnings, right? Um, and incidentally, anything related to operations or information security, we want in a shared source code repo because it means that every time someone pulls from that library, they can now inherit the best security knowledge or ops knowledge of the entire organization. Um, another one is the blameless postmortem, right? One of the more famous uh, properties and, and behaviors of uh, High performers is the notion that when things go wrong, right? There's not this culture. There's not this witch hunting culture. There's not this culture of blame. There's this notion that everyone has a responsibility to participate or even lead blameless postmortems or blameless post incident reviews, so we can capture an accurate chronology of what actually happened, what went wrong, right? So we can best affect, a prevent, a fix. And if we can't prevent, how do we at least enable quicker detection and recovery? Um, and, and just one of the big learnings for me, I was uh, uh, talking to a friend, Randy Schaup. He was the director of engineering at, for Google App Engine. And I asked him what I thought was sort of a leading question. And I, asked, I asked, 
does it matter? And is it still valuable if you have a blameless post-mortem meeting if you don't have any action items at the end, right? I mean, if you're just sort of getting together and just, you know, bitching, right? Does it, are you still creating value? And I thought the answer was no, but he said yes, right? The fact that you're even having the blameless post-mortem, right, sets a cultural norm that is safe to talk about problems, right? Uh, as Bethany Macri from Etsy said, prevention requires uh, honesty, right? Honesty requires safety, right? And so he said something amazing happens when you start having blameless post-incident reviews, right? He said you almost unlock this engineering competitiveness, right? When someone tells about this horrible disaster that happens, another group will say, you think that's bad? Let me tell you about something that happened to us, you know, two weeks ago, right? That's even worse, right? And there's even another dynamic that says eventually, you know, if you keep doing blameless post-incident reviews, you take, take keep taking... Uh, good preventive actions, you run out of outages to have postmortems on. And you now have to go from doing postmortems on just customer impacting incidents to doing them on team impacting incidents. In other words, of the seven safeguards that were there to prevent a customer impacting incident, six of them failed, right? How do we prevent that from happening again, right? And so what ends up happening is that you end up having ever decreasing tolerance for for accidents, failures, right, which creates ever-increasing safety. Uh, by the way, incidentally, what happens in a Toyota assembly plant when the number of andon cord pulls goes from 2,500 down to, say, 10? The management countermeasure is tighten the tolerances to increase the number of andon cord pulls, right? Because if you stop having these uh, andon cord pulls, it means that we've stopped learning. So now we have to tighten the tolerances to keep learning. Um, so what happens if you don't have enough uh, outages? You create outages through things like Chaos Monkey, right? Um, or you deliberately inject faults in the production environment um, so that you can continue to learn, right? So the other famous examples are like uh, the Amazon game days where they would just say sometime in the next two weeks we're going to turn power off to you know an entire data center, right? Uh, get ready. Um, so again, right, if you don't have enough failures, you know, we create the failures. Um, what else? Um, oh, compliance monkey. So one of the big aha moments for me is there's actually something that is said within the DevOps community that I think is actually flat out wrong, right? If you were to listen to a, uh, there's a notion that DevOps people hate process, right? In fact, uh, there was a uh, Facebook talk that I remember where uh, the gentleman said, our number one, we hate process. Number one, we value our people. Second is automation. And number 43 or whatever is process. And you know, with some help some, with some friends, right, I realized what they said is actually wrong, right? They actually love process, right? There's no way that you can merge changes from thousands of engineers and deploy it into production without causing chaos and, you know, uh, and chaos and, you know, uh, contagion, you know, uh, without some sort of process, right? What they don't like are approvals, <laughs> right? And, and we often conflate the two, uh, but it turns out, be very different. Whenever we're doing something many, many times and we have repeatable outcomes, you know, we have a process. And one of the best examples I think of this uh, as a as a counterexample is uh, Netflix Compliance Monkey. So you know, it's famous for uh, finding cloud instances that don't look like the known good states, and if they don't look like the known good states, they kill them in production, right? But there's actually another module of Compliance Monkey that's even more astonishing, which is they look in their service catalog. Uh, and they find any service um, that doesn't have an email address of a developer in the escalation field. And if, the, if it's blank, they kill the service during office hours, right? Why would they do that? It's because it's better we find out about those things in a planned way, right, than in an unplanned way where we have to wake up everybody at 2 a.m., right, to find out who can actually fix this thing, right? So if someone tells you DevOps people don't like process, that's really not true. It's just they don't like approvals. Um, uh, other ways to spread learning is like internal technology conferences, meetups like this, right? Any place where you can sort of take learnings, spread them globally through the organization that can elevate the state of the practice everywhere. Uh, and even I think open source is a part of that. Any place where we can actually pull from well-known repos, you know, and get the best uh, in the field, right? You know, that's another great place. So embracing open source, that's basically benefiting from and contributing to. Um, uh, just one last little side note on this. Um, there's a 
the DevOps Enterprise Summit that we ran, there's a quote from uh, the CIO of HP Enterprise, and he said, our goal is to create buoys, not boundaries, right? The idea is, you know, we will give, if you want to stay safe, you know, we have a nice channel in the river that if you stay within the boundaries, we can guarantee you that you won't get into trouble. We have internal community practice. We have people, you know, we have vendor relationships. We have, you know, we have engineers who can help you when you need help. But if you decide that in order to achieve your business objectives, you need to use something that's not supported, you can. Just know that these are the principles. If you get into trouble, right, uh, you know, you're sort of on your own, right? Um, and, you know, he said, you know, we always need to be pushing the boundaries because maybe that's where the next learning will come from. That, you know, that will allow us to get to the next level of greatness. I just love that. So did you, I just thought this was great because from even from the top levels of leadership, you know, um, uh, this has been articulated. How am I doing here so far? Is this still interesting? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, last thing is uh, one of the big learnings for me was also there's nothing wrong with functional organizations, right? One of the big surprises to me was Google, right? They have 1,300 site reliability engineers, and yet they all report into one VP of SRE, Ben Trainer, right? Why would they do that? It's because only by doing that can they control the level of quality, the staffing, the hiring, right? Quality control and so forth, right? And so, um, you know, I think often the, the common popular pattern is you build it, you run it. There's no test group, no ops group. Um, yet I think eventually, right, capability three says, you know, how can an ops person learn from developers, right? A DBA will never learn from developers or security will learn from developers. They will learn from hanging out with other security people, right? And so I think that's actually what will probably bring us back, you know, to functional organizations where we actually embed them, you know, into the product groups. Uh, one of the more poetic um, verbalizations of Capability 3 was, of course, comes from Steven Spear. He said, the result of Capability 3 for Admiral Rickover, who built the nuclear reactor capability for the U.S. Navy, was that a new young crew and their officers setting, for the, setting out for the first cruise on any U.S. naval vessel, vessel you know, that was nuclear-powered will benefit from the collective experience gained from over 5,700 reactor years of experience behind them. Right, so you know, whenever we have shared source code repos and we have you know the abilities to spread greatness, it means that anyone pulling from a repo, for instance, you know, will benefit from the collective security experience or ops experience or dev experience for the entire organization. Just like you know, any crew setting out to sail uh, on a U.S. naval reactor vessel. So I'll just take a minute to maybe set the lens way wider. <laughs> um, so we all love things like Chaos Monkey, right? Um, you know, where they, you know, reboot servers in the middle of the office hours, you know, to you know make sure that they're as resilient as you as we think they are. So it turns out there's a pattern of behavior within the Toyota production system that does exactly the same thing. And I want to share it with you because I think this is kind of the the message behind how what kind of greatness dynamic learning organizations are capable of. So it turns out at ASIN, they're like one of Toyota's top suppliers. There's an example in this book, The High Velocity Edge, that Steven Spear wrote, where that suppose you have two production lines, right? In this case, it's you know making mattresses you know, that goes into the seats of uh, Toyota vehicles. So suppose you have two production lines capable of each capable of building 100 seats per day, right? What they would normally do is on slow days, they would shift all production onto one line, right? So they could stress test it to see like what are the vulnerabilities that will uh, you know that will um, appear when you actually ramp up capacity right and they do this knowing that if something goes wrong if they blow up everything they can shift capacity to the other line right so i think this is kind of like this chaos monkey like behavior right that's in manufacturing um, there's another example um, of the greatness that's capable of within dynamic learning organizations in February 4th, 1997, there was this famous article in the Wall Street Journal where and it's this one plant um, burned to the ground um, that created this you know, break part, right? And it was the sole source of where to do this, essentially shutting down uh, you know, the build capacity of 16,000 vehicles per day. And so they were predicting that this could cost $40 million in lost profits, um, and coming at a very bad time as they were trying to ramp up capacity, you know, to uh, serve the U.S. market, right? And they were saying this might be the early demise of Toyota, especially because they had such lean 
inventory systems, right? They had almost no inventory to buffer them from errors. So, uh, you know, goodbye Toyota, right? And it turns out that one week later, the Wall Street Journal wrote, they resumed 90% of capacity within a week, right? Uh, getting to almost 14,000 vehicles built per day. And the, re the how they were able to do this was that this uh, essentially ASIN um, was able to spread out the know-how and the tooling across every everyone in the Toyota supplier network to help um, you know rebuild this capacity because what's it's you know it's not good when Toyota dies right it's good for the entire Toyota uh, supplier network so the real breathtaking one is what happened when this happened even on a grander scale in 2002 when the entire U.S. West Coast went offline when there was a famous um, worker strike shutting down 29 ports right uh, and so again very little uh, work in process. There was not a lot of inventory at the plants. How, what, you, what do you do where you can no longer get parts from Japan into the United States? Um, you can't divert the ships to Canada because the unions were sympathetic. You can't go to Mexico because there was insufficient road and rail infrastructure. So what do you do? And it's essentially in the very same way, Toyota was able to mobilize their entire supplier network you know, to get plants running again. So what do they do? Oh, you can't go through the Panama Canal because the ships are too big. So what they did was they bought up all the 747 air freight capacity, right? And it turns out, you know, that isn't enough, right? Um, they also had this problem that ships were just dumping, you know, their entire cargo in Mexico because, you know, they didn't want to wait around, right? Just dumped it, you know, at any port. So essentially they were parachuting uh, these leaders into the Mexican ports, trying to figure out, all right, just how do you get them north, right? You know, they had no experience in permitting or customs or whatever, right? Just they're doing everything they could uh, you know, to get it just a little closer, you know, to where the parts were needed. And the quote that made me uh, teary-eyed was, there was this quote that said, when we saw, because we solve problems all the time in our daily work, when real crises hit, it's just a matter of degree, <laughs> right? And so when you talk about chaos monkey happening in Netflix, right? Uh, I mean, it just really reminded me of this. So I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg of the greatness that's going to get created as we elevate the state of the practice inside of the technology value stream. So capability four is, you know, the job of leaders is not to direct and to control, but it, instead it is to guide and enable. It's not to micromanage people. It's not to create compliance systems. It really is to eliminate obstacles and really help teams get done what needs to get done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about an interesting finding that's going to be coming out later this year on this. Anyway, so... This quote actually comes from uh, the CIO at Target. He said uh, exactly this, right? My goal is not to direct and control, it's to guide and enable. So just imagine how awesome that would be to hear uh, on a, a CIO's first week on the job. Right? It's not to create top-down control systems, it really is to enable teams. Okay, the last surprise I want to share is this. Um, DevOps is not just for the unicorns. And by unicorns, I mean Google, Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, New Relic, you know, uh, these great organizations, but it's also for the horses, right? Large, complex organizations that have been around for decades or even centuries. And so this has been my primary area of study for the last, uh, you know, four years now, right? Which is how can large, complex organizations replicate these amazing outcomes that we've typically only seen uh, in the unicorns? And this is the reason why I've been holding a conference called the DevOps Enterprise Summit, um, where we've been, we invite technology leaders to tell their story. And they, we asked them to tell a very specific type of story called an experience report. And it really made up of the following uh, elements. Tell us about the industry you compete in. Where do you fit on the org chart? Where did you start and why? What was the business problem you're trying to solve? What did you do? What were your outcomes? What did you learn? What, what problems still remain? And so I wanna share with you the top two things I've learned in this. The first is there is no doubt that Large complex organizations in every industry vertical are replicating the outcomes we've typically only seen uh, in the unicorns. And I want to share with you some of my favorite stories. So Heather Mickman, uh, she's a senior director of development at Target. And yeah, she's doing a lot of DevOps-y like things, but what's more important to me is what are they doing DevOps on? The business problem that she set out to solve was this. Every time a development team wanted to get access to the system of record, right? That's product catalog, store information, create shipments, cross shipments. Anytime they wanted to access that data, they would often have to wait six to nine months for the system of records teams to get ready because everything was tightly coupled point to point. 
So the countermeasure was something called they called API enablement. Put all that information into a next generation system of record, you know, based on Cassandra, Redis, and you know, all sorts of new stuff, and a versioned API. So any dev team could add, change, and remove that data, you know, just by calling the API, right? Not having to wait six to nine months. And so they went on record saying that they what they enabled 53 different initiatives, you know, through this capability, right? Including ship to store. So that's one of the most strategic capabilities, you know, if you are competing against Amazon, um, the Pinterest app integration, the Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, the Starbucks integration, you know, a lot of the in-store apps, you know, that their employees use, right? All enabled by what they called API enablement. Her team doubled in size year over year, four times. You know, so I think that just shows how strategic of a capability they viewed this. Um, Topo Brada Pal, he described how they created an internal shared service at Capital One uh, that allows teams to safely and securely deploy into production uh, with lead times not measured in months, but in minutes, right? Um, you know, so allowing them to do hundreds of deployments across the Capital One enterprise safely and securely, right? And also creating automatically all the evidence needed to keep audit and compliance away. Gary Groover at Macy's described how they went from doing 1,500 manual tests every 10 days to now doing hundreds of thousands of automated tests daily. Um, Jason Cox at Disney described how over the years, he's embedded hundreds of ops engineers directly into the dev teams within the lines of business, uh, enabling them to be as productive as if they were working at a Google, Amazon, or Facebook, right? Earning the gratitude of you know, dev managers everywhere. Uh, Carmen Diardo talked about how at Nationwide Insurance, they didn't do this in a satellite peripheral application. They did it for the state pension retirement fund of which they are already the number one segment leader. And incidentally, that's a 40 year old COBOL mainframe app, right? Uh, Terry Potts, she described how they reduced testing and certification time for ground control stations that control satellites Right, um, so you know, all of these things give us confidence that DevOps principles and patterns, right, transcend the technology stack we run on. You don't have to be running an open source LAMP stack or something, you know, a new hippie mean stack, right? It, you can do it for almost any technology stack. So the second, um, oh, oh my gosh, no, no, no. Um, okay, the second learning is just the degree of courage uh, that's exhibited in every one of these transformations. So, you know, I think every one of the leaders that presented an experience report over the last three years, I think every one of them was given some degree of air cover by management, by their leadership, but I think every one of them wildly exceeded the leadership they were given, uh, essentially putting themselves into some degree of personal jeopardy. So the question becomes, why would they do that? And I think the reason is that every one of those leaders had a sense of absolute clarity and conviction that the capabilities they were creating for their organizations was needed not just to win in the marketplace, but maybe even to survive in the marketplace. And so it's been an incredible privilege to help chronicle that journey. By the way, all of the videos and slides for DevOps Enterprise are available online, and I'll show you how to get that at the end. So I talk about courage. Um, let me talk about this. So Heather Mickman uh, from Target, uh, I got to follow her for a couple of days, um, a year and a half ago, two years ago. And it was an amazing thing to see. But one of the more surprising things was what was on her desk. Now, uh, there's this thing that looks like a certificate printed on like Print Shop Pro or whatever you use these days. Um, and it says, Lifetime Achievement Award for Annihilating TEP and LARB. So what is TEP and LARB? TEP stands for Technology Evaluation Process, and LARB stands for Lead Architecture Review Board. Right, and so the TEP is the form you fill out whenever you want to do something novel and unsupported, right? Uh, in this case, it was actually, can we run Tomcat in production? <laughs> and the answer is no, right? Anyway, they fill out the form, right? And you have to make that case to the lead architecture review board. So you walk into the LARB meeting, and uh, on one side of the room, you have all the dev architects. On the other side of the room, you have all the ops architects. They pepper you with questions. They start arguing with each other. They assign you 50 more questions to answer and come back 